In the spirit of the 12 days of Christmas, this video is the 12 framing projects of Christmas, a compilation of various interior framing tasks that we need to take care of before finishing electrical rough in. Some were planned, some not so planned. Today we're working on some new construction renovation, as I like to call it. It's just a few minor framing things that we realized sort of after the fact of framing. And now that we're in our roughing stage, we really gotta take care of it before we get any further. The first order of business is this laundry nook. We have to make some minor changes to this door. When we were planning this out in Chief Architect, we forgot to leave this jam out wide enough for our trim. So this is only two, two by thickness. That's only three inches thick. We'll have a three and a half inch trim detail so we might be able to fit it once the door jams here, but it's gonna look really weird right up against this wall. So I'm gonna add one more two by four to this opening. And then the more difficult part is on the right side here, we only made this opening 54 inches wide. That's the width of a washer and a dryer, pretty much exactly. They're about 27 inches each. After the fact, we kind of realized that the doors for the machines might end up hitting the jams of the doors if we go to open them to the outsides. So more than 54 inches is really a little bit more desirable. The opening itself is more than 54 inches. So we figured we might as well open this up a little bit. I don't really care if there's not enough room for our trim detail on the inside of this wall because it is just a laundry look. You'll never be standing in here to see that. So I'm going to basically remove these two studs and add one stud over here so that we can open up our opening probably four or five inches total once we have the jams on. That'll just give us a little bit more room for opening the doors to the machines up. Getting started on this laundry door, I'm gonna try to salvage as much as this as possible, but I'm thinking I'm just gonna make this board here my new rough opening, my rough, my rough side. So I really just need to remove this and then I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with this. I was contemplating ripping the whole thing out and making it longer and honestly that's probably the most correct way to do it, but I would really rather not if I could get away with it. So this is a non-load bearing partition, literally just a two by four wall to hold drywall with. We will have a door track up here, but what I'm thinking is I'm gonna run some screws uh, maybe toenail them because it's actually a little bit stronger in the grain. The screws will stiffen this all together. I'll do it from the top and the bottom. And then I'm just gonna cut this out and I'm gonna sandwich more material between here. So this is one solid piece and then run some like long structural screws that way, like all the way through. I think it'll be fine. That will be the least intrusive way I think of doing this. She's free. Kind of. I'm really digging into the bottom of the used lumber pile for this stuff. My gosh. Luckily, this is a pretty sturdy end wall that I'm putting this up against. So. Should be able to straighten it out when I screw it all together. This should give you some indication of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Luckily this is just bowed, which is pretty much the easiest defect to fix in a situation like this. I'm gonna start down here where the bow's the worst, screw this thing on, and then use the board's leverage to straighten itself out after I've got this bottom part fastened. I guess the mic wasn't plugged into the camera, so this audio is terrible, but what I was saying was that the spacer is made from a piece of 5 8 roof sheathing along with a 2x4, making for a total thickness of 2 8 inch, which is what I had measured the gap at. However, there's always an infinitesimally small space between boards you can never close, so that's what was fighting me here. Even a couple screws to sandwich the spacer wouldn't do the trick, so I had to go down from 5 8 sheathing to half inch plywood, which slid in perfectly. A little looser at the bottom, but totally fine overall. I'm going to use some of these six inch Simpsons because it'll go through this whole stack up all the way to this other stud. Luckily I had some left over from our garage header project. 
this is a, it, probably the biggest overkill fastener I've used on this project yet, holding up a closet door, but I can be sure that this ain't going anywhere. Laundry door is done. That just feels a lot more open, honestly, not even measuring it. So that is gonna be a good improvement. Definitely not my you know, best framing work up there, but, oh, hello. Can I help you? <laughs> she, she's, she's feeling her, her new laundry nook, that's for sure. <laughs> Certainly not the most robust interior wall framing, but I think it's gonna get the job done. The second bit of reframing we have to do is still in the laundry nook, but it's above it. These are 10 foot ceilings and we realized that that space above these laundry machines is gonna be kind of wasted up there because you're never gonna really be able to access it. So you do have access from this back bedroom that I'm standing in. So we figured why not build a, a little platform basically at the top of that door, take these three studs out and make a platform there. We can use it for storage. We could maybe put a bunk bed or something up there eventually, or at least the head of a bunk bed. It would probably hang out over here a little bit. But we figured we're heating and cooling that space. We might as well use it. Here I'm copying the layout of the studs from the bottom plate. My little two by four joists sit on our wall here at the other end. I know they make hangers for this, but I use pocket screws because of course I don't have any of the hangers on hand. And actually I am so impressed with how strong three pocket screws in the end of a board are. <sighs> 31 and 13 sixteenths. So close, just a wee bit on the end there. And there you have it folks, a completed storage platform. On to the next project. The next little framing task is in our bedroom closet. This is to increase our storage space a little bit in here. It's certainly not the biggest closet in the world and I didn't realize in my plans that I had spec this closet wall as a two by six wall. I think it was because it was underneath this big beam right here, which made the most sense because it's almost the same width. But regardless, it's a closet wall. It doesn't really need to be two by six. It's not load bearing or anything. So instead of just leaving this hollow or filled with insulation when we put the drywall up, I'm going to make some niches out of this little stud bay space here. So I'm gonna cut that stud about a foot from the bottom. I'll cut it up top six feet from the floor and then I'm gonna do the same thing over on this side with this guy. This one's a little bit trickier because I have a light switch here now. I'm gonna to have to sort of cut this out and then move it right over as the side piece. So this one's not gonna be quite as wide. But we're figuring we can put like shoes in there, like sort of downwards or um, belts, ties, hanging jewelry, stuff that can kind of get recessed into the wall and just use the storage space a little bit better.
think that's strong enough for a bedroom closet niche. And just like that, they're framed in. I wish all the rest of these framing projects went that smoothly and easily. I do want to put some backing on these because it is quite a bit of span for drywall to span. So I'm going to use one by furring strips. I'll probably go one at the bottom, one at the top, and then maybe every 16 inches or so just to give the drywall some backing on this side and on the inside of the niche. I'm thinking when the sheetrock crew is here, I'll just have them put corner bead on the inside of this and basically just finish this as a drywall niche only. And then I can decide whether or not I want to use trim on top of it or how I'm going to put the shelves in it, that sort of thing. We can figure that out down the line. Now it's time to basically do the same thing in the pantry. We need to reframe this pantry door behind me. We originally designed this as a swing door. We really didn't think a whole lot about it in the, in the design phase. We should have put more thought into it, but as we saw it framed and we imagined where the cabinetry was going to be, we realized the swing door was just going to take too much up of that room. So instead, we're going to frame this out for a pocket door. We have a really awesome pocket door kit for this. It's probably one of the most high quality you can get your hands on. I'm gonna do that in a whole separate video because it's gonna be a little bit of an involved process to get that torn out, reframed, and install that pocket door kit. So stay tuned on that one. I just finished framing out the rough opening for this pocket door. The track's not in yet. Inside the pantry, pretend there's a you know, wall here because the pocket door takes up double the room that a regular door does. This space right here, I had to go from a two by four to a two by six wall. So you can see I just added like a two by furring strip. You can hardly tell it's even there, but I furred that two by four out to the two by six width did it at the sill plate there, and then I left these two by fours here because I knew I was gonna need some sort of niche here. So I think this would be a really awesome space to store canned goods and like, like mason jar goods. It's like the perfect depth, like about a four inch deep shelf. So I'm gonna cut, I think, I'm gonna cut these two studs, like, I don't know, maybe two foot from the ground, and then like, I don't know, five, six foot from the ground. And I won't come all the way out here because I got an outlet, I got a frame out, but I think I'm gonna have to put a, another stud here and then another one here to make sort of a, a window. And then I'll put the same one by furring strips along this outside wall here so that we can still sheetrock on this and, and sheetrock on the inside too. The one caveat I gotta remember here is this is a little dry bar out here. So there's some cabinetry here and whatnot. I need to remember to leave something to screw my cabinetry to, first off. But then also we're planning on doing some floating shelves above the cabinet. So I have to leave enough structure here to be able to fasten those floating shelves to. Of course, I'll have the door jam and I'll have that end stud, but I'm gonna have to make sure that whatever I frame out here is sturdy enough to support those floating shelves. smokes this is awkward the pressure of the saw makes it want to bind and kick back if you try to go all the way through it with the circular saw got to put on the furring strips niche is done except for the backing strips which I don't have here I think that's gonna be really cool. And I was thinking it would be even cooler to do like a backlighting feature in here. If I could just run a piece of 14 gauge Romex from my under cabinet lighting over in this vicinity, I could probably figure out how to get backlights like LED strip lighting to turn on at the same time as my under cabinet lighting in here. And maybe we could even run the tile backsplash in here too, just as an accent. I think that'd be really neat. The niches are basically done, except for the shower niches, which I am gonna wait until we get our Leda Crete uh, preformed shower niche so I know exactly what size they are before I put the framing blocking in for that, but that should be a really quick job. The next task on my list is blocking in these long ceiling joist spans up here. These are two by eights, but they're spanning probably almost 20 feet um, from end to end. So when you get up there, you're really wobbly to walk on there. There's a lot of flexion in the board. So I want to put a row of mid-span blocking that helps stiffen up the whole diaphragm. It allows essentially sharing of load between the, the joists rather than you know singular 
load. So once the drywall's on there, it will help stiffen that ceiling. And if I'm ever up there walking around in the future, which is likely, I won't be relying on the drywall to keep the joists from shifting around, which could cause the drywall ceiling to crack. So let's put the blocking in now. I'm just gonna pocket screw um, all the blocking in. I like that connection better than like end nailing with framing nailers. It will be a lot better. If you look closely, you can see we did the same thing on the roof rafters up there. Those are just nailed in, they're staggered to make that happen. And that really stiffened up the roof diaphragm. Same thing on these long span joists. And the key here was we used two by 10 rafters, but only two by eight blocking. That kept the gap above the blocking so that we can have a ventilated roof deck. The next project was to add furring strips to the bottom edge of the rafters in the dormers to accommodate more insulation. These ceilings are permitted to have slightly less insulation than the flat ceiling because they are cathedral style and limited to a small area relative to the main ceiling. Furring these down with an inch and a half strip allows us to use a full bat of R38 rock wool and still maintain a one and a quarter inch airspace above for ventilation. The same will apply for just this little bit of sloped ceiling here where we meet the back wall. This is just one small consequence of using dimensional lumber and a structural ridge rather than like an energy heel truss is the available room for insulation is definitely a little bit less and we have to make a little bit more accommodations for it on the back end. But there was no real other way to frame a house like this. The structural ridge was the safest way to go. We could have used like eye joists to give us more ceiling depth in this cathedral ceiling but that would have literally broken our bank. Fun fact, our iJoyce floor system was the single most expensive line item for framing, with the joists alone coming in at nearly $6,000. Adding a spacer to the underside of the rafters was a much more economical solution. I'm actually using scrap 2x4s that were two bowed and twisted to be used in walls, and giving my old Craftsman table saw a major workout, ripping down a ton of them. Elena got all the screws started for me, and then I hung each strip up. The part of the ceiling where the dormer meets the flat ceiling, which also meets the 1012 ceiling, is a little bit tricky. But luckily, it just so happens that an inch and a half furring strip with this double header offset lands at the same place as the inch and a half offset on the 1012 pitch right there. The, that point right there meets with that point right there. That was sort of planned, I guess, sort of unplanned. I don't really know. All I can say is I'm happy it worked out. We can just cut regular two by two strips and I'm just basically beveling the end. I took an angle gauge to find this very shallow angle and I'm just cutting those little pieces on the table saw. Check out my OSHA approved scaffolding system. <laughs> Angle strips and under ceiling furring is finally done. Well, for the most part, I have a little bit more to do like above the stairwell. But before I do that, I need to frame the little mini wall that the Amish guys conveniently forgot about. It's one of these little uh, baby height, you know, five foot tall walls, similar to the pantry and the master closet. But this one goes above the stairway. So right now we just have the slope ceiling and I got to put up a little wall. First step was to put a little temporary platform here. So a couple two by fours, scrap a subfloor sheet. And now I have a place to work from and the wall will go right at the edge of that L LVL header all the way up to these rafters. Got to offset this ledger a little bit so that my plumb line doesn't interfere with the corner of this board. To do the plumb line, I just took my six foot level straight up from the face of my LVL, put a line on my rafters, and then I'm, I basically just eyeballed this until my plumb line cleared the corner of this board right here. Then I'll sort of build this thing in place right here in the wall, get the angle right, we'll be good to go. Before I put the side walls on here, I thought it would be a major pain afterwards to put insulation in. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw about a rock wool in here. I actually probably should have put it in before I even put this guy on, but it'll be even harder once I put the sidewall on. 
So I'm just going to try to slide her up in here. You can actually feel the air getting pressed out of the stud bay when you press this stuff in. Try to be nice and gentle so we don't end up with any dents or voids in the insulation. And it totally fills the stud bay up perfectly. Typically I put a sill plate down first, but because I have an adjacent sill plate that I can shoot nails through the side, I am going to set this in place first. This fits quite well, I'm pretty surprised. I'll put a 26 inch rough opening centered in the door. So I'm just gonna nail on these little eight inch mini sill plates and then I'll do full king studs all the way to the subfloor like I did here, nail them sideways into my sill plates and then just put a flat header up top and nail it in. I measured up and scribed where this thing should hit. I'm gonna keep this rough opening 26 by 38 inches. That way I could get a two foot by three foot door in here. Uh, I'll probably end up custom making the door anyway. Last thing I gotta do is screw this thing in. Screwing because I can't get my nail gun back there. Level this up and then I will nail that in. Good to go. Next task, add a catch. I originally was planning on doing this in this bedroom in here uh, where I have close to where that smoke alarm box is, but I learned the code requirement of needing 30 inches of headroom above the ceiling joist, which I just don't quite have there. I would have to really squeeze it over this door and it's just gonna look kind of like crap. So it'll make more sense to put it in the hallway, even though I think it's going to be not the best looking thing. I'm gonna get a flush mount access door to make it as low profile as possible bestaccessdoors.com is where that's gonna come from. 22 by 30, and I basically just have to cut out one little piece of a joist there and frame in two headers. So it's actually gonna be really easy to frame. I have it marked out. That section with the X is what's getting cut out, and then I will just put two 30 inch long um, headers basically from here to here, here to here, and we will have our ad attic access hatch. catch is done. Next, pantry door. The original plan for this pantry was for me to build custom cabinets to go right here. They were not going to be a full depth cabinet, but I think the plan has changed now and we're going to get them from the RTA store. So 24 inch cabinets it is, and that door is going to be in the way. I actually drew it out here so you can get a bit of a visual, but the edge of a 24 inch cabinet is going to be right there, the front edge, and then about an inch overhang for countertop, and you can see we are into our door opening. So I gotta move the door opening over, and if I want any trim, I want it at least three inches from the edge of the countertop. So I'm gonna put it here, and then on the other side, I'm gonna shift it the same direction. I think I'm gonna make this the new king stud. I'm gonna take this jack stud and move it against this king stud so that my new rough opening is right here at this line. I'll make a new little header plate and then we will effectively have shifted the door left. So let's get to work. Well, it's all done and honestly, you can barely tell that it even changed. You would not know unless you looked really close. And the best thing about this is I didn't actually have to use any additional lumber. I was able to take all the pieces apart, 
and put them back just a little bit shifted to the left. So that is pretty neat. I did have to add a little extension to this sill plate here. Luckily, there is a joist running right here, so I just put two lags in that, and this thing is solid as a rock. So just for a little pantry door, I think it'll work. We're in the bathroom now, and in order to mount a fan-light combo above this shower, I need to fur the ceiling down a little bit. It's really just because of the pipe I did not want to do a roof outlet just for the sake of not cutting another hole in the roof. And I couldn't really do a high wall outlet either because of the sloped ceiling right here. So I'm going to fur this whole ceiling down to eight foot six. Right now it's 10 foot at the high portion. We're going to go flat eight foot six. We tossed around doing like a barrel ceiling and or a tray ceiling to make this look better. but ended up just settling on the flat and we can do some accent later. But this will allow me to snake my HVAC pipe into this stud bay right here. And that way I can come all the way down through the floor and my outlet is actually just under the deck ledger out here. I did that before we did siding. It's not the most ideal run for a bathroom outlet, but part of the reason why I don't wanna just come out of the top of the wall after I fur down is because of our vented soffit. I don't wanna be dumping hot, moist air right next to our roof vent where it's gonna come right up into our vented attic and potentially put moisture on the inner underside of our roof sheathing. So instead, we're gonna go a little bit longer out, a little bit more elbows, but I think it'll be a more robust solution in the long term. The first thing I'm gonna do is put a ledger along this side of the wall. I'll just use some pocket screws, just like I did on the storage platform to fasten the ends of a bunch of studs that are gonna run this way, or joists, I should say. Um, I'll fasten it to that ledger, and then on this side, I think I'm just going to nail them into the sides of all these studs. My ceiling layout will still be 16 on center. It'll just be slightly offset from this wall layout, and I don't have to put a ledger on this wall. So here's what I'm working with here. I've done some mocking up, and I actually furred these down. You can hardly tell because the color is so similar, but there's a two by strip there. That's just a two by four ripped in half and that will give me adequate insulation depth here. I've also put a start to the ledger up. I'm gonna do just what I need in two by six just to mount that fan up. The rest can be in two by four because that's what I have most scrap in. But I got my actual fan box out. This is a Broen Newtone fan and I got a couple four inch ducts to mock up how I'm gonna route that. And you can barely see it, but I've set my laser up on the other side of this room to project a level line all the way around the room. And that will allow me to easily set all the rest of my ceiling joists with just looking at that laser. The laser is mounted up with our clamp there, even with the bottom of the ceiling plane. And we mounted a ledger up here that will support the joists will pocket screw into that and then they will just face screw slash nail onto these studs over here. At the end, I switched to a two by six ledger and we'll just pocket screw on both sides of that. That's mainly to support our bath fan. Here's the housing right there. That's a six inch deep housing, so it needed more mounting surface than a two by four could provide. So let's get all of these ceiling joists up. And say hello to our beautiful pocket screwer getting all the screws started. Shout out to Craig for making really convenient pocket hole jigs. That was the easy part, getting all those on. Now we are into something a little bit more difficult, which is the last two by six that's got to fit this fan. So I've marked the center of the bathroom right there, and then I've sort of mocked this up so that the fan does not hit that rafter at the same time that it's basically at the right height at the ceiling. And then it's also gotta be far enough over this way that it's centered in the shower. At that location, I marked a plumb line at this point on the stud. I think I'll just temporarily screw on a piece of two by here, clamp the fan box up against it, and then that will give us the perfect spacing to put our stud right here. Sorry, our ceiling joist right here. I've just temporarily clamped this box in place where it's gotta be, both centered this way and this way in the shower. And now we have a good clear indicator of where our ceiling joist needs to go. So let's get that screwed in. All right, our clamp is in our way. Oh no, it should be far enough down. I just have to make sure it fits first. The elevation of the box I might have to change. I didn't, that was a guesstimate, so. We're just trying to get this mounted. This is a very dirty board. Yes, but it's a very straight board compared to the other ones. We wanna make sure it's square, so 
boat, you're probably gonna have to hammer that side in. There's a little it's gap. It definitely needs to go more on your end. You got to the inside at a 28, 28 and three quarter. Here it says 32, so you just gotta come in quite a, quite a bit on your end and quite a bit out on my end. Yeah. That's not going anywhere. <laughs> We're clamped into place now that we have our joist in. I'm gonna just go ahead and screw through the mounting flange on the back side. After we insulate the ceiling, I'll put one or two more ceiling joists on the other side of the fan to support the drywall. Another lingering task I wanted to take care of was flattening the walls where we will have cabinetry and tile. Our framing has had plenty of time to dry out and some of the studs have crowned, bowed, and twisted in the process. To make life easier when cabinet and tile installation comes around, I went around with a level to inspect the studs and left sharpie notes on studs that were out relative to the rest. Then I came through with a power planer to shave these parts down. This little bit of effort up front goes quite a ways when it comes time for final finishes. I did the same thing on groupings of studs and rafters that weren't quite flush with one another so that the drywall would sit flat on them. And that's a wrap for the 12 Projects of Christmas. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you on the next one.